Hello everyone, this is Josh Dales, pastor of Wellspring Tabernacle. And today I'm going to be bringing a message that I pray will bring hope and peace to your heart and your life. We need peace in these troubled times and we find that peace in the Word of God. I want you to get your friends and your family and let them know that this message is getting ready to be preached. I want them to be blessed by it as well. May the Lord bless you. Let's jump into the Word together. This morning, we're going to continue our journey through the book of 1 Corinthians and um, surrounding, looking through that uh, that main theme of of being called higher. And there's going to be several other sub-themes that pop up as we go through this book. But um, today, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. And so while you're turning there, we'll have a little bit of an introduction. But in the 1700s, there was a man named John Newton who worked aboard a slave trading ship called the Pegasus. And the Pegasus would take spices and other items to trade for slaves on the West African coast. Um, And uh, the slaves would then be bound for the Caribbean and for uh, North America. But in 1745, The crew really of the Pegasus really didn't care for Newton all that much. And in 1745, he found himself being sold into slavery. And for three years, he lived as a slave for uh, Princess uh, P.A. of the Sherbro people. And now Newton at this time was an atheist who vehemently denied the existence of any kind of a god. But in 1748, at the... uh, there was a ship called the Greyhound that at the requ- and the captain was requested by Newton's father to look for his son in West Africa. And he found him and Newton was rescued. Well, on the voyage home off the coast of Ireland, that ship was caught in a great storm. And for the first time in his life, Newton, fearful that he was going to die, found himself crying out to a God that he had previously not believed in for mercy. And God granted that Newton, granted Newton that mercy. And, and by Newton's own admission, he wasn't saved at that time. Over, to, over the next few months and years of his life, he would come to embrace evangelical Christianity. And, and as many, many years on down the road, he was actually ordained as a priest in the Church of England. And he, this man now a former atheist, a former slave trader, would come to write what is, in my opinion, the single greatest hymn that has ever been written in all of time. An atheist slave trader turned Anglican priest who would later go blind is the one who wrote the words to Amazing Grace. And it's this Amazing Grace that we find in our text this morning. And the Apostle Paul had written to the church at Corinth regarding the problems that was within their congregation. And after he greets them in verses 1 through 3, the Bible says, starting in verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. With God as my helper this morning, if I could, I I want to preach on the thought of amazing grace. And now there's no way that anybody could ever fully expound and exhaust the subject of grace. The, ever, the church has been found, established for over 2,000 years and as with as many words and as many things have been said about the grace of God, no one has been able to exhaust this subject and we will never be able to exhaust the subject of the grace of God. And while I don't know any, everything that could be said, God's given me a few things this morning. Um, with regard to what we see in this passage. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for the many blessings of life. God, I thank you for your grace this morning. Thank you for your mercy towards us. 
And God, I pray now that you would allow me to preach. God, help me. Hide me behind the cross. Fill me with the Holy Ghost afresh, God. An anointing touch this morning. God, I pray that you'd move in amongst your people, Lord, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name we do pray. Amen. But first, I want to draw your attention in verse 4 to the cause of grace. Paul says in verse 4 that he's thankful for the, for the Corinthians, but that he's thankful for the grace that they've been given by God in Christ Jesus. And the one fact that people, that everybody has at their fingertips concerning the Corinthian church is that it was a mess. All right, they had they had problems, they had sins, they had division, they had heresy. It was, and, and in this way, it was no different from any other modern church. We've got problems right here at Wellspring this morning. Okay, but anyhow, the church, I want you to understand something. The church is a fellowship of sinners before it is ever a fellowship of saints. Okay, even if those churches don't, which have glowing reputations, and they're known by everybody far and wide. If you were to go there, it's, I guarantee you that it would be known by the pastor and by the members that they've got they've got weaknesses and they've got sins within that congregation. And the sad thing is, is a lot of times that church members that aren't dis, that are dissatisfied with what's going on at the church that they're in right now, they'll say, "Oh well, the church down the road's got everything going on," so they'll just hop right on down the road there. And this restlessness. Comes Causes a habit of church hopping, and one of the and one of the best antidotes to that kind of an attitude is to look again, is to look at this passage and what Paul says here about this messy church with at Corinth. But, but I want you to notice this just real quick. Paul does not go into this with a bull in the china shop mentality of wanting to tear the Corinthians a new one because they were messed up. Okay, He sees them. He looks at the Corinthian church as it is in Christ before he looks at anything else that is true about this church. And this statement of faith that Paul makes is what is one that we rarely see in the local church. We'll be the first one to complain about a problem. We'll be the first one to point out an issue. But Paul... But before we do that, before wrestling with this long list of problems, we need to be able to thank God for the grace that is seen in that local body. All right, He doesn't go in there. The, the Corinthian church had problems. They had big problems. But they, like us this morning, had been visited by the grace of God. And Paul recognizes that as he has been given grace, that that grace he's been given requires him to show grace to others. And grace is the uniting force and the people of God are the are the object of that grace. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and then it makes the plea to be reconciled to God. It was We were the object of God's grace from the foundations of the world. Let's just go ahead and get deep here this morning. The Bible says that Christ is the lamb that was slain from before the foundations of the world. Well, why Y'all need to understand this morning that grace and that Catholic Calvary was not an afterthought for God. It was the plan before God ever said, let there be light. Before the God of heaven stepped out on nothing and spoke into nothing and created something, the cross was already in place. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because the Bible said that when the fullness of time came that Christ died for the ungodly, it was already done in heaven before the world was ever began. And the church of the living God this morning, Acts 20, 28 says unto the church of the living God that he paid for in his own blood. The church of the living God was the object of the grace of God the entire time. Yes, <sighs> and I, but I want to remind you this morning, thinking about, thinking about the church of the living God, and as Rita said earlier, individuals make up that body that, are, that is called the church. And I want you to understand something this morning. I was reminded as I was studying through this. Anybody ever listen to Jerry Clower? Yeah. I love listening to Jerry Clower. Jerry Clower, he was a funny man, but he was also a, he was also an ordained deacon. He was a very godly man. He, he never failed to share his testimony with folks. And one time Jerry was contacted by another deacon in the church that he attended about somebody that had fallen off the wagon and gotten into sin. And he said, we need to go over there and straighten him out. And Jerry replied to him and said, well, why don't you just get up a bucket of rocks and go stone him while you're at it? And that is why, and there are, there are, 
I want you to understand this. All right, why, why, did, why did I say that about Jerry Clower? Because there are people in our lives that have royally screwed up. There's people that have sinned against God, they've sinned against you, and they've sinned against those you love. And I, I, we, I know that there's people in my life that are like that. There's people in your life that are like that. But here's what Paul's saying, and, and this is what I echo this morning. Regardless of how badly the person or persons might have sinned, if they're truly a child of God, we all need to recognize something that even in the midst of the screw up, in the midst of the trial and the failure, in the midst of the worst mess you can imagine, they're still a child of God. And even though they've messed up, there's enough of them left left to salvage this morning for too long the church has treated people that mess up like garbage we'll what somebody will fall off the wagon and they'll get out of the will of God we'll want them up and throw them in the trash can and start running them down and start talking about them the Bible says right the opposite the Bible says if one of you stumbles you who are spiritual go to them and restore them we've been given a ministry that not only snatches people from the jaws of a devil's hell but when we stumble and when we fall, it also gives us the grace to go and help pick that person back up. And that's what Paul is telling the Corinthian church this morning. We were worth, he says, you were worth so much to God that Jesus died. Well, you're the object of his grace, and that regardless of who you are or what you've done, there is grace this morning that will redeem and restore. It's no wonder that when John Newton penned the words, he said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's no wonder that he used the word amazing to describe the grace of God, because the Bible says that God did demonstrated His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were unworthy and died without God, without hope in this world, living in sin with no desire to worship God or to be right with Him, there was something greater than you and I that reached down to where we were and pulled us up out of the ditch and out of the gutter. The Bible said that He pulled us up out of a pit and out of miry clay and set our feet upon a rock and a stone established our goings. But this greater thing came from a greater someone, somebody that was stronger, somebody that was more powerful than us, that caused the grace of God to appear in our lives. And rather than holding us responsible for our sins and dropping us off the deep end into hell, rather than giving us what we deserve for our sins, He gives us grace. And it's this grace that enables us to rise above what we were and what we would have done and do what God wants us to do. We have been given grace and I thank God this morning for that grace and because of being given that grace, because God has shown grace to you and I, we now have to show grace to others and that's because the cause of grace, now watch, the cause of grace leads way into the character of grace. Looking at verses 5 through 7, verse 5 says, starts off by saying that you were enriched in everything by Him. All right, now right off the bat, I want you to understand that this is not talking about being materially rich. This is not about money, but at the same time, it means that nobody who comes to Christ is poor. While you may not be rich in material things, you have been enriched by Christ. So if this isn't talking about material riches, what is it talking about? Think about this, okay? The themes of spiritual bankruptcy and spiritual wealth are very prominent throughout the Bible. All right, the people that Paul preached... Uh, the people that Paul wrote this letter to lived in a society that produced great material wealth but created spiritually bankrupt people. It was a society that thinks little that thought little else of anything except making money and having fun. And in that, you see a constant look at look at the world that we live in today. People want to be entertained. People want to have fun, and that leads to a deterioration in the quality of life. Okay, the worth of a, the worth of yourself and of persons diminishes, and the quality of relationships begins to deteriorate. And soon, the distinctions between right and wrong fade, and values become distorted. 
distorted. Social pressure pushes us towards evil. And that was the pattern of life in first century Corinth. And it's and I believe it's a very accurate description of what's going on in the world today. Paul's claim is that in a world of such spiritual poverty, in a world of people that the Bible says, y'all listen to me this morning, the Bible says that we were aliens and strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. It was Israel that had a covenant with God, not the Gentiles. We were strangers to it. We were aliens to it. But God come down in the in the person of Jesus. Y'all just y'all don't mind let me get beside myself this morning, if that be alright. When I think about God in eternity past looking down and saying that I'm going to redeem for myself a people and I'm going to call them Israel and I'm going to redeem them out of both a chosen race called the Jews and a people of all other races called Gentiles. Why do you think it is that John wrote about over in Revelation? He said, after this I look and he said, lo, a number that no man could number of all nations and tribes and tongues that bowed down before the throne and before the Lamb and cried out salvation and honor be to our God and to the Lamb that sits on the throne forever and ever. It was because they'd been grabbed hold of by the grace of an almighty God. Oh. <sighs> but what I want you to understand is that that we live in a world that is so spiritually bankrupt that when someone finds the Lord Jesus, when someone is saved with the grace of God, Christ has enriched them beyond measure. Paul here, he's pointing out some past action in their lives that they didn't start and it has made them rich. <coughs> and Paul's not making a comparison here. Now you hear me, he's not making a comparison between what they were and what they ought to be. But instead, he's thinking of the kind of people that they were and the kind of lives they'd lived before Christ came into their lives. I might not be who I should be. But thanks be to God, I'm not who I used to be. I'm telling you right now, the grace of God run into me. The grace of God chased me all my life. And finally on February the 18th of 2010, the God of all glory and grace swam down into my life and He took that old wretched dead sinner that I was and raised me to walk in newness of life with Him. As the old song says, I went down a beggar, but I came up a millionaire. More than that, you can't measure the grace of God in money. You can't measure the grace of God in things. It's unspeakable. You can't describe it. You can try to. And it's in the trying to that we wind up just bragging on Him because we can't describe it. We can't explain it. But we know that it's because of it, because of grace, that we're no longer who we used to be. Oh, but the Corinthian church, they, they had confirmed the gospel in their own experience and, and, and a life that, and this, and, and in a life that grasps the truth that God is rich. And I want you just to look at these phrases that Paul uses. He says, the grace of God was given to you and in everything you are enriched by him and you come short in no gift. These three statements speak of the great generosity that God had toward the people of Corinth and the great generosity that He has towards us here this morning. But I want you to notice, I want to point out something just real quick, okay? And this is, we were talking about it before we got started about, you know, about individuals and the church and all that. Watch this. These statements are about the church that was at Corinth, not about individual believers. If we're to know and to experience the fullness of the blessing of God, it has to be together in fellowship. If we're to experience all the gifts of His grace, if we're to know the fullness of His grace and, the, and, the, and see the gifts poured out, we have to be together in fellowship because you and I will never experience that fullness. We'll never know the depths of the riches of Christ outside of the local church. You have to be part of a local body. <laughs> because no individual Christian can, I don't know, maybe some of y'all can, claim 
that you have all the gifts of the Spirit at your disposal at all times? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Since we don't have it individually, we need one another. All right, now, so as individuals, we don't have all the gifts within us, but the local church where the gifts are allowed to grow and allowed to flourish and people are allowed to, to exercise them and to believe for them and operate in them, you've got the potential for all of them to come together in a corporate life that leads to a mature expression. But notice something else. People, and I know that we as we in the, you know, charismatic Pentecostal world, we put a lot of emphasis on being filled with the Spirit and on the gifts of the Spirit and all that stuff. But I want you to understand something here. In giving us Jesus, God has given us all He has. He can give us no more. We have everything in Him. You say, well, what about the baptism of the Spirit? I would ask, I would answer your question with a question. Who is the one that baptizes in the Spirit? It's Jesus. Everything that we have in the Christian life comes from Christ. We have everything that we need in Christ Jesus. And because we have everything that we need, I want you to look real quick at what Paul says here. He says, and that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. These people loved God. They were messed up. They were a mess. Like I preached a while back, they were a mess, but they were His mess. God had been very gracious towards them. He had blessed them with His gifts. And now they were, they were eagerly looking and waiting for God to, to come back. They were looking eagerly, awaiting for Him to come back. And when we talk about these gifts of God's grace, Paul specifically stresses that the church has been enriched in utterance and knowledge. That word utterance means speech. So in speech and knowledge, Paul is adamant that God has fully endowed the entire congregation with these gifts. And, the, and, and I've got no doubt that Paul's thinking about a particular bunch of friends with different gifts because on the speaking side, Okay, he's going to include all the different speaking gifts, you know, preaching, prophecy, tongues, all of these things, and any use of the gift of speech which contributes to building up the church. And as far as knowledge is concerned, do you hear me this morning? You do not need some sort of esoteric knowledge to come by your way. The church has access to all the wisdom and insight and discernment that it and truth that it needs. We don't need some special guru to bring it to us. Why do I not need that? Because I've got 66 books of perfectly divinely inspired infallible truth that God has given to mankind that he has preserved from the time that he gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai and give him and give him the book of Genesis God has preserved that all the way up until today and there's people that want to cast doubt and say oh well we can't believe that because it was it was translated and then retranslated and then translated by this one and then that was took out and then this was took out there's a conspiracy theory for everything especially surrounding the Bible today but I want to assure you this morning that when you pick up the Word of God when you hold a copy of the Word of God in your hand be it the King James or the New King James or whatever when you hold that in your hand you can say unequivocally so I have the Word of God in my hand and it is my rule and my right for life and godliness I don't need some knothead to come try to tell me some, some kind of mysterious thing. No, show it to me in the Bible. Take me to the Word of God and show it to me. And Paul also in verse 6, he makes, he makes a couple of points about preaching in particular. He says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed among you, and what that means is Paul's reminding them of when he proclaimed to them the unsearchable riches of Christ while he was there for the 18 months that he spent there. It was they, they began slowly to, and, and gradually to appreciate the richness and in their inheritance as children of God. Okay, In other words, they were enriched in proportion to the quality and clarity of Paul's preaching. 
We wonder why churches aren't flourishing. Y'all have heard me say this before. We wonder why churches aren't flourishing the way that God would have them to flourish. It's because if there's, if there's, if there's bad stuff coming out of the pulpit, right. there, we go. there will be misunderstanding in the pew. If there's fuzz in the pulpit, there'll be fog in the pew. And that is the issue that we see in the majority of churches today because I know this, I cannot survive on fluff. I can't live my life on fluff. And this is the best way in the world I know how to make this comparison. And I'm going to do that real quick and then we'll go on, okay? Um, if you tried to eat a, t- a, a literal tub of fluff for breakfast, say you picked out some of that marshmallow fluff from the grocery store and you just sat down and decided to eat that for your breakfast, you know what's going to happen to you about two hours after you eat that? You're going to have the worst crash that you've ever had in your life and you are going to be starved to death versus now if you get if you break out the eggs and you eat some eggs and some oatmeal something that'll really stick to your ribs and help get you through it'll hold you over i need preaching i need to hear preaching you need to hear preaching that's not going to puff you up for a few minutes or maybe a day or two and then bring you crashing down i live in a real world you live in a real world we have real problems that we need real help with and the only thing that we're going the only way we're going to get that help is by going through the Word of God line upon line, precept upon precept, and applying the truth of God to our lives. And that's what the Corinthian church had experienced. Paul had proclaimed Christ to them so so clearly and so adequately that they become the most gifted church in all of the New Testament. They took that message to heart that much. But the two points that he makes about preaching is this. First, the privilege and the responsibility of the preacher is to uncover and explain all that belongs to the church in Christ. And number two, bear preaching, fluff preaching, is not going to cut it. Why do you say that? Because it has to be confirmed. And that word confirmed literally means secured in the lives and in the hearts of those who hear it. And that requires the work of the Spirit of God to bring conviction, illumination, and faith. Why did Paul say this? He said, my preaching to you was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. If you do not have, you are not hearing preaching that is made alive and quickened by God the Holy Ghost, that is with power and demonstration of the Spirit of God, you need to go somewhere where you hear real preaching. Because the church is fully endowed with all the gifts of God's grace. They need to be discovered. They need to be explained. They need to be appropriated. And for this to happen, preaching has to testify to the unsearchable riches of Christ. And preaching like that, if you're going to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, you had better know that you need the power of the Spirit to work in and through you and what you're preaching. But now, very quickly, I know I'm I'm getting I'm getting ready to come to an end here. But now, real quick, looking at verses eight and nine, all right, we've seen the cause of grace, we've seen the character of grace, and now I'm going to look at two things together. We're going to look at the confirmation of grace and the culmination. Of grace. Right, so not only is Paul extremely positive and thankful about the resources that the church at Corinth has, but he also has a great confidence from the Lord about the future of that church. Whatever ups and downs they might face, Paul is sure of the faithfulness of God. Look what verse 9 says. He says that God has called them into fellowship with His Son and He will confirm it. He will make them secure in that fellowship. He will confirm them to the end. All right, now, now just like last week in verse 8, we see some italic words. Okay, you remember these italics aren't in the original text and they're added to make better sense of the passage. I want you to look real quickly at verse 8. The Bible says this, Who will confirm you to the end that you 
you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The phrase that you may be is in italics, okay? That means that it's not part of the original text. Paul is not hoping that the Corinthians are going to be presented blameless. That's not the message that he wants you to hear this morning. He is not hoping that God is going to do this thing. He knows beyond any shadow of a doubt that God in Christ is going to be able to present you blameless. Uh, and I want you to read, we're going to read it again without the italics in there. Who will confirm you to the end, comma, blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Out of all the promises that we've been given in the Word of God, one that I especially love and that brings my soul comforts over in Philippians 1 6, where Paul says that we're confident of this very thing that He which has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. There's something inside every saved person that they didn't start and they're not keeping going and it's going to continue to work in them until it takes them home to glory. What is that thing I'm talking about this morning? It's grace this morning. Grace is at work in our lives every single day through the pain, through the hurt, through the heartache, through the good times, through the times when you're living on the mountaintop, through the times when you're walking in the valley. Thanks be to God this morning. It's all of grace. And one day, I want y'all to get to if y'all don't under if y'all don't hear nothing else this morning, I want you to hear this. The same grace that saved you, the same grace that is working in your life, the same grace that is confirming you is the same grace one day after a while when that eastern sky rolls back in on itself. It's that same grace that we're going to walk, that we're going to be able to go up to the judgment seat of Christ and that He's going to look at us and say, you welcome in, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful to a few things. Now I'll make you ruler over many. Welcome in to the joy of the Lord. And it's going to be that same grace. Grace ain't going to stop when we get to glory. It's going to be that same grace that continues and it keeps on rolling as long as eternity rolls. What do you think that's? I, can, I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know what it's going to say, but I tell you now, I believe the song that's never been sung is going to have a whole lot to say about the grace of God. I believe that that number no man can number as they gather around the throne and they cry out their praises to Him that we've been presented blameless. We've been kept in the fellowship of His Son. And now one sweet day when we get to glory, we're going to get able, be able to look at Him face to face. We're going to be able to behold Him just as He is tonight. We're going to be able to see Him and to know Him and to worship Him fully like we've never worshipped Him before. And it's all going to be because of the grace of an Almighty God. Oh, we have been called by the initiative of God Himself to share in His Son. And God will not abandon us or go back on His promises. The force of the word faithful in verse 9, that's the force of the word faithful which is that we can totally depend on God. He's not a man. He cannot deny himself. He'll keep his word. And I thank God the book of Hebrews says that it's impossible for God to lie. Yeah, the church and y'all, y'all, mm, y'all, we have such a problem in the church today of people trying to keep themselves right with God. And I'm not trying to say that we just need to shirk our responsibility and not live right. That's not what I'm saying. What I want you to understand is, is that if your favorite preacher falls, if he has some kind of a moral failing, don't let that kick you out of fellowship with God and get you out of the church. Just because mama and daddy or a brother or a sister may have done something to you that wasn't right, that they shouldn't have done, don't let that kick you out of fellowship with God. And you say, well, why is that? I want you to understand this. The church is God's responsibility and He is committed to the perfecting of the saints. God's goal is not merely to meet the need in your your individual lifespan. Uh, and he certainly guards that, okay? And he guards it with a personal care. But his, his goal is to present us in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ blameless, without spot and without blemish. And I'm just crazy enough to believe that he that's begun a good work in you is going to keep on doing it and keep on doing it and keep on working it and present you blameless before God Almighty. 
<laughs> oh. And here's something that we have to understand is when we take the teaching on this subject of being presented blameless and God being faithful in this entire letter, all right, this entire letter is a full disclosure. It is literally the unveiling of Jesus Christ as He really is and it also shows us the true quality of our service for Him because it shows us the inner purposes and the motives of our hearts. You think about as we eagerly await for the day that Christ returns, how, how do we show that eager that eagerness and how do we show that? We show that each time we gather around, we gather around and partake of the Lord's table. The Bible says that when we do that, we commemorate the Lord's death until He comes. We celebrate it in baptism. When someone is buried with Christ in likeness of death and raised to walk in newness of life, just like one day all the dead in Christ, First Thessalonians 4 says that the Lord Himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. And there shall we ever be with the Lord. But it looks at us being raised into that incorruptible life in what Paul would call later in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians a spiritual body. And it's a day that Paul longs for even at the end of this letter, when he ends this letter with, with the phrase, even so come Lord Jesus. And I want you to understand that God's faithfulness extends to that day and it extends beyond it into the fullness of eternity. And He will keep His people guiltless. When the secrets of men's hearts are disclosed and, and you know we might have had a legitimate fear of being finally found guilty before Him, God is going to ensure. He is going to ensure that absolutely no charge or accusation is laid against His people, whether it be by human beings, whether it be by the devil himself, the great accuser of the brethren. On that day, it will be made plain. And I thank God this morning that it is God who justifies and that those whom He has justified, He is also in the self same act of justifying them has brought them to the place of being glorified. It's going to be Jesus who matters on that day, honey. It's His day. He's called the tune and we share in His glory on that day. We're not under judgment for sin on that day. And you say, well, what are you talking about? I'm a child of God. Judgment was pronounced on my sin on Golgotha. Yes. When Jesus died, when He cried out, it is finished, that was court, prosecution, executioner, the whole nine yards. That was the whole nine yards on my sin. And it's the whole nine yards on the sin of anybody else that comes to Him by faith. But if we've been called to share and fellowship with Christ. We need to abide in Him. And the only way of gradually becoming like Him is to abide in Him. When we become like Him through the grace of God that's continuously at work in us, it's going to be impossible for any guilt or for, any, for even cause for guilt to exist. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because of the radical purpose God has committed Himself to in calling sinful, fallen humanity into fellowship with His Son. Yeah. And that the practical implications of this glorious hope in the terms of our, our vision for the local church, it's, it's pretty well straightforward. It means that we are unreservedly committed to the church where God has placed us. And that we're confident about God's desire and ability to make His church in that place like Jesus Christ. And we, then we know, we're certain that He's called us to be holy 
for he is holy. What do you think he's going to do at the culmination of grace when he presents us blameless? We're going to be a holy people. But it's no wonder, and I'm about, like I said, I'm about done. It's no wonder that when John Newton penned the words to Amazing Grace, he called it amazing. Matter of fact, I can't think of a better word to describe it than amazing. We will never, and here's the thing, we'll never in this life or the life to come be able to understand the depth, the width, and the height of the grace of God. And I don't need to. And neither do you. All I know is I like what that song said. It said, if grace is an ocean, then we're all sinking. Friend of mine, I'm here to tell you this morning that I don't. it does not matter to me how deep and how wide and how great His Father, the Father's love is for us. I don't need to know all the details. All I need to know is, is that He has invited me to come and be a partaker of it. And that's all that I need to know. I don't need to know the details. All I need to know is that I've been called into fellowship with God in Christ and that one day after a while regardless of my faults and my failures I'm going to be presented blameless before Him and that in the meantime He's going to see to it that we've got ample supply of His Spirit to continue the journey. And I thank God for that. Like I said, I don't need to understand all the great details. I'm just thankful to know that He has shared that grace with us. Hello everyone, Pastor Josh here and I want to thank you for listening to today's message. I pray that it has been a great blessing in your life and I hope that you come back next week as we go into the Word together again. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and leave a positive review. That helps the message you just heard reach a larger audience. Until next week, I pray that you are blessed in Jesus' name.